Hey there, Doug with B&H here to look at the brand new, very exciting release of Intel's new 12th gen core series of processors. Now, those into computer hardware will likely know this as Alder Lake. And so today, we're going to build a computer around the top end i9 12900K. We'll be looking at the latest features in the new series as well as a high level overview of the new architecture. Now, we've built this PC right here for creators, so we'll see how it fares in productivity focused applications. And if you stick around, you'll learn just how you could get your hands on this beast of a machine for yourself. Let's get started. Today, we'll be looking at the top end of the new 12th gen CPUs, the Core i9 12900K. Now, with the new Alder Lake architecture, this is Intel's biggest redesign in years. The real draw here is the CPU's hybrid approach, combining eight performance or P cores with eight efficiency or E cores. In total, you have 16 cores with hyper-threading enabled on the P cores, bringing you to a total of 24 threads. The P cores are aimed at high performance applications that need more power, higher clock speeds, and higher single-threaded performance. Meanwhile, the E cores excel at multi-threaded applications that don't lean so hard on clock speed and instead can parallelize across the multiple low power cores. The P cores have clock speeds of 3.2 GHz base, 5.1 GHz boost, while the E cores start at 2.4 GHz and boost up to 3.9 GHz. Now, personally, I'm dying to see how the CPU splits up workloads between the cores, especially for applications that can fully maximize the CPU. We're gonna test this out later, so hang on for a bit. The 12th gen is the first desktop CPU to support DDR5 memory, though it maintains support for DDR4 as well, making the upgrade path easier for a lot of people. Of course, this support also depends on the motherboard you have. Now, for this build, we are sticking with DDR4 as it is more widely available at the time, though as DDR5 becomes more widespread, it's good to know you can plan ahead with your own build. There's a lot of updates with the 12th gen in regards to I.O. and expansion capabilities. You've got 16 PCIe 5.0 and 4 PCIe 4.0 lanes here, giving you 20 total. This means there's effectively more bandwidth for high-powered GPUs and high-speed NVMe storage, which we're using here. Alder Lake also provides USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 support, which can reach speeds of up to 20 gigabits per second. This is especially important when, say, transferring huge files from solid state and flash camera media. Of course, there's also a brand new motherboard chipset to accompany the 12th gen. The Z690 chipset provides additional PCIe 4.0 lanes and USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 ports, which of course free up the bandwidth on the CPU itself. Lastly, the latest Intel UHD Graphics 770 provides 4K connectivity, and as an integrated GPU, you can of course have additional hardware acceleration options that we'll be looking at later on. We're pairing our CPU with a new Gigabyte Z690 Aero G board with plenty of I.O. and overclocking options. The Z690 chipset is of course the star here, but for the purposes of installation, you'll notice that this is Intel's first series to use the new LGA1700 socket. Though Intel has a new cooler solution of their own to match it, We'll be using Gigabyte's Aorus Waterforce X360 to take care of the cooling. Because it's so new, if you're upgrading, you'll likely have to get a new fan or a new mounting bracket from your manufacturer. Intel's 12th gen supports the new DDR5 memory standard, but because it is so new, we did opt for DDR4 here. Do keep in mind that you need the right motherboard for your desired memory type, so if you're looking to upgrade from a system with tons of memory already, you can probably save yourself a few bucks by just sticking with DDR4. We're going with 64 gigabytes of DDR3600 here since we're targeting a productivity and creativity centric build. For those interested in motion graphics in particular, the general rule of thumb is that it's better to have more RAM than the fastest RAM. For storage, we're going with two Western Digital Black SSDs, a two terabyte primary drive and a secondary one terabyte drive, which I'll be devoting to cache. These are both NVMe drives, so they have incredibly fast read write speeds and take up pretty much no space within the case. I will, however, also place a traditional hard drive in here in the form of a Western Digital 4 terabyte enterprise drive. Despite going mostly SSD these days, I do still like to have at least one internal hard drive for big files and long-term storage. So, you can probably see just what we have up there. Getting one of those is kind of hard these days, isn't it? For our GPU, we'll be using the mighty NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3080, which should handle just about any game you throw at it. 
More important for our needs though is the healthy 10 gigabytes of GDDR6X VRAM and 8704 CUDA cores, which are crucial in GPU-based rendering and playback in quite a few applications these days. So everything you see here is contained in the NZXT H710i case. Now, I love the H510 that I used in some of our previous builds, including my own personal computer, but I wanted to up the ante just a little bit here. The cable management, as predicted, is fantastic, and there's even a vertical GPU mounting option, though we're not gonna use that here. There's ample room for drives, both solid state and traditional, and the included fans should keep the case well ventilated and, as you can see, lit too. My personal favorite feature here is the radiator tray on the top of the case, which comfortably fits our water cooling solution. So we've closed it up, the build is done, and the final touch here, of course, is especially for us creators who never seem to have enough hard drive space on hand. Well, we'll be attaching this SanDisk Professional 8TB 2-Bay G-RAID. Now, it's connected over USB-C and should provide us ample space to get started on some heavier projects. The first boot up, which is always a little bit of a nerve wracking process, was a success. But after upgrading to the latest BIOS, I took a quick look to see what the clock speeds were, the RAM speeds, temperatures, and of course, that every drive was recognized. Everything looked great, so as you can see, I've already installed Windows 11. Now, these 12th gen chips are a totally different beast than anything before, so while my testing here will be primarily concerned with performance first and foremost, I'm very interested in seeing how the workloads are split among the P and E cores. In specking out this build, I was aiming for creativity applications first and foremost, so we'll try out a mix of real-world programs that push the system. Here we are at the desktop. First things first, I just want to check the initial stats here in hardware info. Now you can see the cores are broken out already into both P and E cores with their different clock speeds and clock ratios. Idling temperatures are also cool in the low 30s and utilization is almost non-existent, as expected of course. This is idling after all. So my preferred go-to for any kind of editing test is a real-world project. This Premiere project has 10-bit H.264 source footage, Lumetri color effects, very high resolution images with some motion effects across them, sound mixing plugins, and a few After Effects motion graphics as well, just for good measure. It's a realistic mix of content that is a good measure of rendering performance and utilization. So let's export this to ProRes 422HQ. As a largely CPU dependent codec, this avoids us using any GPU acceleration in the process. As soon as the export kicks off, you see the P cores boost to nearly 5 GHz, while the E cores jump to 3.7 to 3.9. Core utilization is actually fairly evenly divided among both the P and E cores, which is nice to see, though the total utilization per core rarely exceeds 70% or so. You can see the averages here are mostly below 50%. Temperatures do occasionally spike to the 90s depending on the shot being rendered, but they tend to stick to the 70s. Now, not surprisingly, the E-Cores do seem to run a bit cooler. Because of this, the boost clocks are actually maintained for the entire render, which is really nice to see. For reference, this nearly 15-minute 4K video took just under 10 minutes to render out. Next, I'll be looking at a hardware HEVC export in Premiere, which in this case is actually based on NVIDIA's acceleration. Now, at this time, there doesn't seem to be a way to force Premiere to use Intel's encoder, unlike their decoder option, which you can select, as you can see here. Regardless, this is still a very useful test to show CPU utilization in a system and workflow that splits the workload up, which for many web deliverables, which a lot of us are doing, it's a real world example. Predictably, clock speeds can really climb here, nearly maxing out as they did before. What's interesting is the core utilization. Now, it's hard to know the exact breakdown on Premiere's end here, but the P cores receive most of the workload, with the E cores handling almost none. Even among the P cores, utilization doesn't really breach the 30% mark on average, but keep in mind, this is more to do with software optimization than hardware. As a result, temperatures here are consistently pretty low, with averages hanging around 60 degrees Celsius. The hardware accelerated approach here took eight minutes on the dot to export. Since we just came off of a hardware and code test, I wanted to see how Intel's UHD 770 graphics could be used in conjunction with the main CPU. Now, the encoding program Handbrake allows me to select Intel's encoders specifically, and so that's exactly what I did here. The source file here is another ProRes 422HQ mezzanine file. Using a balanced quality profile, I kicked off the encode. 
Clock speeds immediately shot up to 4.9 GHz on the P cores and 3.9 on the E cores. Though, utilization is actually a different story here. Since most of the work for the CPU here is simply decoding the source video and encoding the audio track, the P cores are the only ones really doing any work here. If you scroll down a bit, however, you can see the graphics cores of the UHD 770 being put to work. Utilization isn't really being measured here, but you can see that the GPU's clock speed climbs up and down. Notably, Handbrake reports an incredibly fast 56.3 FPS average for rendering speed, which for 4K HEVC is remarkable. The six minute, 21 second video took two minutes, 46 seconds to render, which is pretty much impossible to beat. As a final test, there are other real-world cases that can push a CPU to their limits. I'm talking 100% utilization across every core for sustained periods that is not a synthetic benchmark. Once again, Handbrake, with its multitude of encoders, is perfect for this. Now, for speed reasons, I'm going with a 4K encode with the X264 encoder. So yes, this is H264, not 5. This is purely software-driven, though, meaning the GPU isn't touched at all. After kicking off the encode, clock speeds do jump to 4.9 GHz on the P cores, but quickly decrease to 4.6, where they stay for a few minutes. For the entire duration, core utilization is finally at 100% across the board. Both P and E cores see averages in the high 90s, and for a 4K video using X264's very slow preset, we're hitting an average of 6 FPS by the end of the encode, which, believe me, is more impressive than it sounds. Temperatures do get high here though, with P cores hovering in the mid to high 90s for almost the entire encode. E cores seem locked at about 89 degrees Celsius. Now this is quite hot to be sure, and as a result, by the end of the encode, P core boost clocks dipped to 4.4 gigahertz, with E cores sustaining at 3.5. The encode lasted 27 minutes, giving me a decent look at what 100% utilization looks like over a sustained period of time. Now keep in mind, this is a real-world case for some people, myself included, but certainly not a measure of everyday performance for most. In more common cases with mixed CPU utilization, temperatures are absolutely manageable and clock speeds are maintained for far longer. In fact, this is the only test where they dipped below 4.9 on the P cores. So just as a last note, I'm sure it's lost on no one watching this with everything that we've put inside this build. It's got tons of power for gaming. Now, we didn't test any games with it today, but my guess is that the P cores can really kick in for games that still need single-threaded power, and there's still 16 threads from the P cores alone before you even get to the E cores. This could also mean that the CPU can better run background tasks and other applications, like let's say streaming, for example, while still blazing through the latest AAA games. So, you want this PC, don't you? Well, it's real simple to enter. Simply email us or tweet by following the instructions in the video description below. There's a link in the description that will explain all the contest rules. Now, what are you getting here? Everything that we put into the case is yours, including the CPU, the GPU, and the storage. Now, there isn't a monitor or keyboard included here technically, but you will get the 8TB G-RAID that I mentioned before. So as you might know by now, I absolutely love building PCs whenever I get the chance. Trying out the new Intel 12th Gen Core series has been especially fun though, since it upgrades not only the main CPU performance and architecture, but also brings a whole new platform with a slew of extensions, such as DDR5 and PCIe5. This machine here is ready for some demanding workloads, and it's also ready to find its way into a lucky viewer's hands. So that's it for the Intel 12th Gen Core series. I'm Doug with BNH, and I'll see you next time.